Okay. Welcome everyone to this webinar. I'll be doing this again in, in another couple of minutes, but uh, looking forward tonight to an interesting uh, and very important discussion about Israel's sea and what we're doing to protect it here at SPNI, Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. I'll turn on my video and say hello to y'all in person. Uh, I'm Jay Shofet, coming to you from Tel Aviv, where I live and where SPNI is headquartered. Uh, we are spread throughout Israel in some 40, some 40 units all over the country, north to south, our birding centers and our field schools and our community branches. Um, we're spread out and do a lot of work in all sorts of nature protection, environmental education, fostering a love of the outdoors through hiking trails. I'm sure you guys all know that. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining, for supporting us. Uh, about, we're about at the top of the hour, so uh, we will get officially underway here. My name is Jay Shofit. I direct Partnerships and Development here at SPNI, and uh, happy to be with you here tonight, as we are every other Sunday this time. Um, sorry we didn't pick up on the... Uh, time change, but I guess you all did, and I guess worst case scenario, you tuned in early. Um, but thank you everybody for being here. Thank you everybody for your support year round and uh, this evening. We, we feed off the engagement from all of you and appreciate it very much. Please let us know in the chat where you're from. Please, uh, please write some questions if you have them uh, and Hadass is not answering them in, uh, in, the, in the question and answer uh, feature. And we will get to them at the end. Das will speak for 40, 45 minutes or so, and uh, then we'll take some questions. I'll field them and uh, discuss with her the issues that you guys would like to discuss as well. Um, I want to thank our board members uh, in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, in France, our affiliates around the world for your support. Uh, appreciate it very much. And tonight we're going to be learning about one of the most important areas uh, for support and one of the most important things we do in SBNI, uh, which is protect uh, Israel's blue half. Um, you know, it's a hard, hard to think of it that way, but when you look at uh, a map I bet Hadas will have, you'll see what we mean by, uh, by Israel's blue half, our Mediterranean coastline and our, and our waters there that we are territorial and economic waters. Um, Avi, we're live on Facebook, I'm hoping. And uh, welcome to all of you there as well. Yes, we are. Uh, great, great. So uh, I think we can, uh, well, it's actually only one minute after the hour. So, uh, and people are still joining at a fast and furious pace here. Uh, so again, thank you. Wow, lots of, uh, lots of new places in the chat from uh, well, a lot of people from Florida, Arizona. The Sun Belt, Edgewood, New Mexico, where the plains meet the mountains. Spent a nice time in New Mexico on my last trip uh, in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, but I'm going to get to Edgewood. Um, Lee Mass, my neck of the woods. I'm from Berkshires, Millerton, New York. Manhattan. Zichron Yaakov, familiar with that place? Lovely town. Toronto, Newton, Baltimore. Great to, uh, great to see everybody here. Miroslav in Belgrade, um, a war in Europe that's not there. It's a good distraction tonight from what's going on in the world to learn about uh, how we're gonna be protecting the waters. And, and Adas, you know, I guess the issue of um, natural gas and, uh, and uh, energy sources in general around the world are more in the headlines than ever. And uh, I will ask you a question to think about if you're not gonna be talking about it already, which is how do you think this war and the sanctions will affect the, um, our, our ability to protect the sea? And particularly the, what I'm already hearing is a push to extract more natural gas as fast as possible uh, from, from our seabed and from, from everywhere, frankly. So um, that, that I know the environmental consequences of this war have, a lot of people worried and 
uh, as it relates to the sea, um, you know, we'll look at that today. And not that I'm saying that those environmental consequences are more urgent or compelling than the obviously human com consequences, but that's our topic tonight. And we're gonna get underway uh, in just a second. I see we have a few questions already about preparing for sea level rise. Well, as somebody who lives two blocks from the beach, I am curious about that as well. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> okay, thanks, Jonathan. All right, I think we're gonna get going now. Hadas, um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hadas is somebody, uh, somebody uh, I've known a long time. Actually, I've worked with both of Hadas's parents and all sorts of nonprofits and social change organizations in Israel. Uh, thrilled when she became my colleague in, uh, in SBNI. Uh, the young generation really is going to have to inherit the problems and come up with the solutions um, of the previous generations, as they always do. And I think we're optimistic about what's going on with the young generation today, and, uh, and particularly the renewed, renewed dialogue, uh, the, the, uh, especially um, urgent dialogue we're feeling more and more, I believe, about uh, about climate change and also about nature protection, the other side of the same coin. So uh, anyway, Hadas, thanks very much. Looking forward to an interesting webinar now on uh, on uh, Israel's blue half. So take it away. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Jay. So yeah, my name is Hadas. Um... My, my family is uh, actually based, uh, some of them are based in the States and I think they're connected here too uh, today. So that's uh, nice, so thanks for whatever family's here too today. Um, I work in the SPNI in the Marine Project. Um, we're called the Blue Half and we're gonna learn today why, why that's our name. Um, I'm a marine biologist. I have a master's in business administration. And I hope that throughout my talk today that also sort of comes into play how conservation has to be something interdis interdisciplinary today in order to really make change. Um, and so we really are going to touch on on all different um, subjects and all different ways to sort of um, make conservation happen. So I'll say that most or, or even all of the footage you're going to see here today, the pictures and what you're going to see in the videos is all stuff that's been uh, um, uh, taken here in the Israeli Mediterranean Sea. So sometimes um, the Mediterranean and especially our part of the Mediterranean is thought to be sort of uh, not as rich, especially for whoever's come to Israel and has visited the Red Sea. So if you're looking at the Red Sea versus the Mediterranean, you might think um, oh, there's not a lot to protect here. But as we go through our talk today, I think um, um, we'll have a, a very different picture of that. Um, so why are we called the blue half? Uh, sorry, what do we do in the blue half? Uh, uh, we deal with uh, sustainable fishery management. We promote uh, declaration of marine reserves. We work on minimizing effects of, of gas exploration. So we're gonna talk uh, about that today. Someone already asked a question. Um, and we protect endangered species. Um, all of that is sort of wrapped in our work with the public. Um, we have an app that we'll talk about um, at the end called Sea Watch. So that's the picture that you see you know, on the left. And so why are we called the blue half? Basically, when looking at uh, Israel's coastline or Mediterranean coastline, we're actually talking about uh, 26,000 square kilometers. Sorry for the metric system, guys. Um, that is even more than the terrestrial part of Israel. So while we're called, we're called the blue half because actually half of Israel and even more than half of Israel when counting territorial and economic waters is actually um, more than what we have um, on land. So that's a lot, a lot of nature, marine nature that needs um, protecting. Um, something that that wasn't sort of at the, at the uh, top of our minds. It's only in the last decade about that, that people have started to realize that we really need to be paying attention to what's going on in our seas and in our oceans. And I'm really happy to say that SPNI, I might not be objective, but is leading, um, leading this in Israel in terms of um, marine conservation and, and protecting what we have. So let's watch um, a short video sort of um, introducing us to, to the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you. 
אנחנו הישראלים מתים על הים. ומה אנחנו עושים בים? חוץ מאת זה, אנחנו שומרים. חבר'ה, יש מצב שאתם שומרים לי רגע? שומרים. שלא נשרף, שלא נתלכלך, שלא נלך לאיבוד. אמא של גלי, הבת שלך מחכה לך בסוכת המציל. רק על הים אנחנו לא ממש שומרים. יותר נכון על מה שבתוכו. הים המופלא שלנו הולך ואוזל. מתחת למים שלנו יש טבע מטורף. ספארי ענק של בעלי חיים, צמחים, שוניות. הים הוא לא אותו הים בכל מקום. העולם המופלא שתמצאו מטר מחוף השרון שונה לגמרי מהים של ניצנים או מהים של עתלית. וזה רק בעומק 15 מטרים מתחת לפני הים. תראו מה קורה בעומק 100 מטרים. כשצוללים פנימה, מגלים עמקים, רכסים, קניונים, דיונות. בים שלנו יש יותר מ-50 בתי גידול שונים עם מינים ייחודיים שחיים רק כאן. שלא תבינו, ברור לי שהעולם מתקדם. יש בים המון פוטנציאל כלכלי ולכולם דחוף לממש אותו. גם אני בעד, אבל חייבים לעשות את זה בתבונה, אחרת לא יישאר לנו ים. הים הזה... שבלעדיו ישראל היא חצי מדינה, מאפשר לנו כל כך הרבה טבע מדהים, תיירות אקולוגית עם פוטנציאל צמיחה, מה שנקרא כלכלה כחולה, תרופות חדשניות, אוויר לנשימה. 50% מהאוויר שאנחנו נושמים בא מהים. כאילו רוב מי השתייה שלנו מוטפלים מהים. Mm. <אח> הים הוא חלק מהזהות שלנו. לשמור עליו זה לשמור על עצמנו. חייבים להקים לאורך חופי ישראל רשת של שבע שמורות ימיות גדולות, מהצפון ועד הדרום, ליצור מרחבים שבהם החיות מתרבות וגדלות ללא די, ללא קידוחים, ועם רשות אחת שעושה סדר ומפקחת על הים. הגיע הזמן להקים שמורות טבע ימיות. really crazy potential in terms of what of what the Mediterranean has to offer. Did you guys hear? Did we hear the um, sound in the last video? So I know. It's yes, 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 we did. Okay, great. Um, so um, in this short clip, we're actually looking at here he comes a bluefin tuna that's about to show up. So this is right here in Israel. We have um, groupers, um, very large predator fish. We have small fish like seahorses. We have stingrays, lots of kinds and species of stingrays that are actually relatives of sharks. And we have sharks too, and we'll get to that. Um, um, so, so about 60 different habitats, um, hundreds of endemic species, really unique nature um, that needs to be protected. Um, so what, what is that nature? Uh, um, why is that nature under threat? Why do we need to protect it and, and from From what? So one of the main threats to nature in the sea um, in Israel, but actually worldwide is overfishing. Um, not a surprise since we're talking about direct extracting of fish um, from the system. So whether it's overfishing, meaning we're fishing, we are taking fish faster out of the system than what the system can, can uh, reproduce and can replenish itself. Um, a lot or most of fishing methods are also unselective, meaning we have very high numbers of bycatch, whether meaning, meaning species that we don't actually intend to catch. Um, we don't want to eat them. We don't want to sell them. That could be sea turtles um, um, that get caught on, on fishing hooks. That can be young fish like this small grouper that got caught in a ghost net, meaning a net that's already been left behind. Same for this seagull. Um, that got entangled in fishing line um, that was just discarded on the beach, right? This dolphin uh, that washed up on shores in Batyam, so south of Tel Aviv about one or two years ago, you can see the scars on his body. This is from uh, trawlers, uh, fishing trawlers or bottom trawlers are very big boats that um, drag a very large net on the bottom of the sea floor and basically catch anything in its way. Uh, bycatch is very, very high for this method. So we're talking about 80% um, bycatch. That means only 20% of what they're catching is actually making it to the markets. Um, um, and, and so many fish and so many animals are, are hurt in the meanwhile. Um, climate change, so we brought this up. Climate change is a big uh, driver changing our oceans today. Um, in Israel, one of the main things that we're seeing um, is, is the uh, 
invasive species uh, finding finding their way to to our shores. So basically, basically this started over 100 years ago with the opening of the Suez Canal, so connecting the Red Sea to the Mediterranean, allowing species to basically um, move from uh, um, from from uh, Indo-Pacific uh, species into the Mediterranean, like the picture of what we see here. And what happens is that they have, uh, they're in competition with local species and, and can drive them fully out. Uh, a lot of these species are also harmful to humans, um, like a lot of jellyfish that are coming in, like these fish that we see in the picture. And maybe uh, I, if there's a lot of Floridians here, so you guys know of the lionfish in the Caribbean. We have the same problem here with lionfish um, that we're trying to deal with. Um, the, the warming waters actually allow those species to sort of base themselves even better because they're coming originally from even warmer waters from the tropical waters um, of the Indian Ocean. The heating of the ocean, we're talking between three to four degrees um, every 30 years, is um, also affecting species directly. In this picture, we can see uh, a, a local sea urchin. Um, we used to be able to see it a lot uh, here in the Mediterranean. Today, um, it is very rare to, to, to see. And one of the reasons uh, that, that we're not seeing it anymore is because of the temperature. So, so a study that was happening here in Israel really shows we can see the blue line is temperature. And as the temperature goes up, we can see the red line showing how there's some critical point where this urchin disappears. And what happens in ecology is when one species disappear, you, disappears, you have that niche that ecolog ecological niche. And now today we can see one or even two different species of sea urchins coming from the Red Sea um, um, that are much more prevalent than this original local sea urchin. Um, habitat destruction. So over a third of animals in the Mediterranean have already been affected, whether it's infrastructure, someone uh, wrote here about, um, about uh, pipelines, um, so, so that affects directly uh, uh, the habitats of, of many species in the Mediterranean. The same bottom trawling is also hurting uh, the bottom of the ocean. Sometimes we think, ah, it's only sand, what's, what's there, but actually it's a whole habitat um, filled with many very special animals, soft corals, rays, um, fish that live um, in the sand. So they're all being affected um, by habitat destruction, uh, building on beaches. So any species that also count on the beaches, for instance, sea turtles that, um, that come up to the beach in order to their, lay their eggs are being affected. Um, also in their, the, the most crucial time where they need to reproduce to lay their eggs and they come up to a beach, but instead of a beach, there's a building. And how do you deal with that? Um, pollution, Sewage may, might be the first thing that comes to mind. Um, happily, I can say today that um, Israel's situation is much better than it was a decade ago um, in terms of raw sewage um, that isn't really getting to our seas anymore um, most of the time, um, but there's still work to do. And we're also starting to deal with lots of new kinds of pollution. So noise pollution having to do with um, shipping, uh, shipping companies, army, uh, so lots of noise going on in the ocean and that can affect uh, animals and their ability to reproduce. Light uh, brine water. So in the video, we heard how most of our drinking water here in Israel is coming from desalination. What are we doing with all of that salt? Where is it going? So in this picture, this is actually where the brine is coming out, um, not in very deep waters, which can also, um, which should also be a question if that's the right way um, to be dealing with it. The picture that we see underneath here is the tar. Um, I, I don't know if any of you were connected uh, um, almost exactly a year ago when um, tar landed on our beaches, large amounts of tar. And we, um, I connected and we had a short talk sort of explaining what's going on in Israel. Um, so there were lots of cleanups since then. Um, there's still tar on the beaches. Every time I go, um, I, I still pick some up and throw it away. So. Um, Definitely, it, it's a long-term uh, issue to get rid of all of that um, tar. And of course, oil spills, but we'll, we'll go into that a little bit, maybe in, in, in a few more minutes. Um, so what are we doing to protect our seas, right? So we can talk about all of these um, threats and it, and it could seem pretty pessimistic, like what, how are we going to, to, to change all of these things and to affect 
climate change and, and so on. Um, I'm happy to say that there's a lot going on in Israel and in the SPNI. Um, and I think we're making um, great change in terms of what's going on in, here in Israel and looking 10 years back to what's to, to, to and, and to versus what's going on today. Um, I'm really proud to be part to be part of this project. Um, so promoting 30 by 30, maybe this is something that, that you guys have heard of. It's actually an international campaign to um, declare 30% of our oceans, of our global oceans, as marine reserves by 2030. Um, today, we only have 4% reserves, but there is a plan that you can see here in the map of seven reserves along our coastline in, uh, in the territorial waters of Israel, and you can see what their status is. I'm happy to say that um, um, this reserve all the way um, in the south is called the Iftach Reserve, and it was um, only a few weeks ago approved in the planning committees. So there's still a ways to go, but that is one step closer to, um, to declaring uh, um, another large reserve here in Israel. Uh, let's go a little bit deeper into that, uh, into reserves. <laughs> בואו נדבר רגע על שמורות הטבע הימיות. למה כל כך חשוב לנו שיהיו לנו שבע שמורות גדולות ועמוקות, ללא דייג, ללא קידוחים, בפיקוח של גוף אחד? בואו ניקח לדוגמה את צווי הים. את המזון שלהם הם מוצאים בעיקר ברכסי הכורכר התת-ימיים שפרוסים לאורכה של ישראל. הרכסים האלה נמצאים לפעמים בעומק של תשעה מטרים, לפעמים בעומק של ארבעים מטרים. אזור הזנה אחד לא מספיק, והדרך למסעדה לא תמיד קלה. מהחרפות מעליהן לא מעט סכנות, דייג לא מכוון, תשתיות, כלי שיט, בשבילם זה כמו לחצות שדה מוקשים. רק שמורה שמייצרת רצף בין אזורי המחיה השונים, תמלא את יהודה ותספק להם מרחב מחיה בטוח. ולמה השמורה צריכה להיות גם עמוקה? כי החיים לא נגמרים במרחב שבין עומק של תשעה מטרים לארבעים מטרים. קחו עוד דוגמה, חתולי הים, רובם מוגדרים מסכנת הכחדה. החיות העדינות האלה חיות בטווח עומקים רחב. בקיץ תוכלו לפגוש את הגיטרנים בעומק 30 מטרים, בחורף אותם גיטרנים נודדים לים העמוק. עכשיו תגידו, מה ההיגיון להגן עליהם בקיץ ולא להגן עליהם בחורף? הלו, הלו, גברת! לא לצלול יותר מ-30 מטר, מה קרה לך? זה חוק החורף! החיות לא עוצרות בגבול השמורה. הן שוחות במשך מיליוני שנים במעגל חיים קבוע, ממקום למקום בים התיכון. רק שמורה, בעלת טווח עומקים רחב, מסוגלת להגן על מחזור החיים המלא שלהם. מבינים? העומק כן קובע. אז למה לא גם וגם? גם שמורה, גם לדוג בתוכה? כי זה לא עובד. רק שמורה ימית, שיש בה איסור דייג, מאפשרת חברה אקולוגית בריאה, כזו שבה הדגים הטרופים, כמו הדקרים, שומרים על האיזון. והתוצאות? שגשוג דגים בשמורה, תיירות אקולוגית, והעשרת השטח שמחוץ לשמורה, בדגה שזולגת ממנה. עכשיו תשאלו, למה שבע? למה שגורם אחד יפקח עליהן? כי השמורות הימיות קשורות אחת לשנייה, ומתפקדות כמסדרון אקולוגי שמאפשר לבעלי החיים לנוע בקלות ולחפש מרחבי רבייה, הגנה ומזון חדשים. כדי שהן יעבדו וישגשגו, חייבים שיהיה ביניהן מרחק הגיוני. לא כולם דולפינים שצולחים מרחקים גדולים. מכשולים כמו מרחבי דייג, קווי תשתית, קידוחי גז וזיהומים יכולים להפריע. כי פה דיים למשל, בכלל לא יודע לשחות. ומי שנע אצלו למרחקים, אלה התינוקות שלו, ששוחים בקושי בזרם. הם חייבים שהמרחק בין השמורות יהיה לא יותר מ-50 קילומטרים. יש רק פתרון אחד שעובר. חייבים להקים לאורך חופי ישראל רשת של שבע שמורות ימיות גדולות, מהצפון ועד הדרום. עם רשות אחת שתנטר, תאכוף, תפקח על השמורות ותעשה סדר בים מול גורמי תכנון, צבא וגורמים אזרחיים מסחריים. הגיע הזמן להקים שמורות טבע ימיות. Marine reserves really are the best option um, for nature and, and also for people. And I think um, that that has to, to come hand in hand. Basically, when we find that ground that, that, that that's going to be most beneficial for nature and also for the public, um, that's going to be the sustainable, that's going to be the point where we can really do sustainable uh, conservation. So here's an example from Florida showing a, a marine reserve and fishing vessels 
all along um, what looks to us like a, a very specific border, but to them when they're in the sea is invisible. And the only, well, I mean, they have a map, but one of the best ways for them to know is just because that they're in the right place is because of the amount of fish that they can catch. So if they're sitting right on the edge of this reserve, that's gonna be the spillover that we just heard about um, in the movie, in the video um, of fish that were able to reproduce uh, quietly inside the, the reserve and then we'll, we'll leave uh, the reserve and, and we'll allow sustainable fishing outside of it. While inside we can have educational activities and tourism um, and, and so on. Um, so we were talking about reserves in the territorial waters, but I want now to move on uh, into, the, into the economic waters or the EEZ. Um, the deep sea of Israel. So this is something that's only been uh, being discovered um, in the last uh, um, few years. Um, research that's uh, going to 800, 900, and, and even deeper than 1,000 meter, meters deep. We have uh, um, coral garden gardens. We have ghost sharks. Um, we have special anemones, and we even have coke cans. Um, so just showing why, um, showing how human activity really does make it into all corners of the sea. Um, and so while it's very far away to us, um, it's actually pretty close and needs protection as well. Um, it's something that we are promoting um, as we speak. Um, we have uh, contacted uh, and had a campaign to the, for the Ministry of Environment. Um, um, sort of pushing towards declaration of another reserve um, in the deep sea called Palmachim Disturbance. Um, so let's uh, see a little bit of, of what's going on in that reserve. Mm -hmm. Do we have sound on this one? No sound. Hmm. Wonder why. And figure that out. Now we have cat. One second, sorry, you guys. Okay, let me figure out why we don't have sound. One sec. Ah, I know why, because my PowerPoint has frozen. All right, are you seeing it in full screen? No. Not full screen. <clears throat> full screen now. Great, and hopefully we'll have sound. If not, we're gonna... איזה טבע מדהים יש בישראל. החרמון, הכינרת, ים המלח, ועוד תופעת טבע סודית שכמעט אף אחד לא מכיר. היא היחידה מסוגה בישראל, ומעטים יודעים על קיומה. הפרעת פלמחים. לא, זה לא כאן. פשוט את הפרעת פלמחים אי אפשר לראות, ואף אחד עוד לא דרך שם. אלא אם אתם רובוט שיכול לצלול לעומק אלף מטרים מתחת למים, בים התיכון. אתם יודעים, הים זה לא רק פלטה כחולה של מים. מתחת יש נופים משוגעים, צוקים, הרים וקניונים. דמיינו רובוט כזה, שצלל למקום הכי נמוך בים העמוק של ישראל, הוא חשף שם אתר רבייה לטונה כחולת סנפיר, אלמוגים בני 1,500 שנים וגם בעלי חיים שמתקשרים באמצעות אור שהם מייצרים בעצמם, ויצורים שמייצרים אנרגיה מנביאת גז בחושך מוחלט. קולטים איזה מקום מטורף? אז למה בעצם חשוב לשמור על המקום הזה? על הירח כבר עשינו צעד קטן לאדם, בים העמוק עדיין לא. הפרעת פלמחים נוצרה בגלל גלישה מערבה וכלפי מטה של מדף היבשת של ישראל. כיום יש לה רכס כמור בצד המזרחי, רמפה רחבה, רכסים צרים ותלולים ונקיקים עמוקים. הטופוגרפיה הזאת, יחד עם נביאות גז המתאן שמאפשרות חיים, יוצרות בתי גידול נדירים ומעניינים. אבל סכנה גדולה מרחפת עליה כתוצאה מקידוחי גז ונפט, דייג בשיטות מסוכנות, ועוד. למקם אסדת קידוח בטווח של קילומטר מהפרעת פלמחים זה כמו למקם אסדת קידוח צמוד לשונית האלמוגים באילת. 
השרה להגנת הסביבה, הפרעת פלמחים היא אוצר לאומי שחייבים לשמר. הפרעת פלמחים, בואו לא נפריע לה, כי אין עוד מלבדה. That's the campaign that we started a few months ago, and I'm happy to say that the Minister of Environment has uh, joined the cause, and hopefully, uh, with her help, we'll be able to, to promote a, a reserve there. Um, we've also recently applied um, to the Sylvia Earle uh, organization called Mission Bloom, maybe some of you have heard of it, um, to be recognized as a hope spot. And if that comes through, that will also help us um, sort of want, get one step closer to uh, declaring our first marine reserve in the economic waters of Israel. Um, um, so that's what we're doing in terms of, of reserves. We're also promoting sustainable fishery management is in Israel. Um, in 2020, the FAO uh, declared the Mediterranean as the sea um, uh, with uh, the most overfishing, the, the most overfished sea um, in the world, not not a title that we that we wear proudly. Um, um, but I am happy to say that there that we've been working very hard on this in the last decade um, and we're able to promote a fisheries reform in 2016, basically updating the fishing laws in Israel after they hadn't been updated since the Israel since the British mandate. So at least 70 years. Um, that we were using the same uh, fishing laws or almost non-existent fishing laws. Um, so these laws now um, um, limit where, when, how, and what we can fish. Um, also in uh, even a daily catch quota for, for sport fishing. Um, and one of the big things that happened is that we were able to close um, a large portion of Israel's waters to bottom trawling, so 40% of um, Israel's seas are now, or the Mediterranean, are now um, closed to bottom trawling. Uh, these fishermen um, received uh, compensation. Um, and this, and in this video, we can see one of these vessels being uh, sunk and, is, and it's now a site for, for diving. So once again, finding that point that is the best also for nature and also for, for the people involved. Um, But now we're continuing um, on working on, on, on fully buying out the bottom, bottom trawling fleet here in Israel so that 100% of our waters are trawler free. Um, as we speak, we have a petition to the Minister of Agriculture um, explaining why this is so bad. Again, um, lots and lots of damage to nature and also a very, very small amount of fish are actually making it to the markets from this type of fishing method, less than 1% um, of, of what of the, the amount of fish that people eat here in Israel is coming from trawling, but the, but the damage it's doing is, is, is much more than that. Anybody who's watched Seaspiracy has probably sort of gotten a taste of what trawling means. Um, today, and if you haven't watched Seaspiracy, C C I, I uh, implore you to go watch it. Um, there are some points there that are not exact, um, um, but as a whole, I think the, the, the overview of what, of what they talk about in that movie is very important in order to understand what's going on in our seas today in terms of, of fishing. So we have this petition and it's um, the SPNI together with many more environmental and marine organizations and uh, um, animal rights organizations here in Israel. Um, and I really hope that we'll have very good news um, soon. We also work to protect endangered species outside of marine reserves. So they're protected in those reserves, but um, outside of them, um, some need even more protection, whether it's this grouper here on the left um, that I'm very happy to say was declared by the previous ministry, uh, Minister of Environment um, last year as a protected species. So it's the first um, fish that is eaten widely in Israel that is now protected and is not allowed to be fished. Um, um, groupers uh, in general are, are different levels of um, endangered. 
in Israel, but but also in the world, um, because it's people say that they taste very good. Um, so this is something that we're seeing also around the world that groupers are disappearing um, from from the environment, and they're actually a very important fish because uh, they are predators. Um, they have a, an important role in uh, the balance, the ecological balance. What we're seeing in this video are are sharks. Um, sharks right here in Israel. Maybe some of you have heard of, of sharks that come to winter here at the power plants. So hot water is coming out of the power plants, meaning the water that's um, cooling the turbines. And these sharks, I guess they like to warm to warm here. There's probably more reasons why, why they're here, but we're not exactly sure. Um, we're not aware of this uh, phenomenon anywhere else in the world, except uh, for something similar in Florida where manatees like to, to um, warm in the water coming out of power plants, but we've never seen sharks doing this um, because it's not a reserve and is actually in a site that's a pretty opposite to a reserve, meaning where there's a lot of infrastructure um, and a lot of human activity. Uh, what's, what happens is you can see here, even some people just standing around looking at the sharks, um, but this is actually a quiet day. We actually, on, on good days um, where, the, where the waters are calm, we have lots of divers, lots of fishing activity, lots of motorboats, and that's dangerous to sharks and to people. And so today uh, we are working on creating some sort of uh, regulation, working with the uh, Nature and Parks Authority um, to, to really make the most out of this special site. So to allow people to, to witness nature in a way that's safe um, to the sharks and, and to the people. Um, this is a lot, a lot of what I've talked about is, is basically um, uh, enforcement has to happen for all of that um, to be effective, right? So we can see here um, a video um, of a fisherman who was fishing during uh, the breeding season moratorium, meaning two months a year where there is no fishing allowed. For the two months where most of the uh, species of fish are breeding. So we have to give them that time to replenish. Um, um, that is sort of at the basis of sustainable fisheries. Um, so this was a video taken by rangers of the Nature and Parks Authority. Um, um, of this fisherman that went out to fish uh, during the breeding season. On the right, we see um, a case of, of a catching um, of a shark. This wasn't intentional. We talked about bycatch a bit earlier. All sharks are protected in Israel, meaning you're not allowed to intentionally, intentionally fish them. And if they are caught, you have to return them to the water as fast as possible. Sadly, that's not what happened here in this picture. Um, we can see the cell phone uh, in the picture. So lots of selfies and lots of pictures and taking their time before that shark returned to the water. Um, a ranger was in the area and was able to come and make sure um, um, that that shark was returned, hopefully safely um, to the water and, 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 and was able to continue his life afterwards. We're also um, working on creating legislation in the EEZ. So this is part of that reserve um, that we're talking about in the economic waters of Israel today. The EEZ is outside of, uh, is not in the jurisdiction of Israeli law. Um, territorial waters are, economic waters are not. That means um, that there's a loophole and that and that activity can can go on there pretty much without any regulation, without taking into account the environment, without taking into account the public. Um, and, and that loophole is used mostly by um, gas and oil companies uh, that want to that want to search, uh, explore for mostly for gas. Um, and we are working on making sure that things like we see in this picture won't happen here in Israel um, by creating this legislation that will allow um, to, to make sure that, uh, that any activity that's going on there also has to take into account environmental measures. Um, and like I said in the beginning, um, we also make sure that the public can take part um, in everything that we're doing. Um, uh, sustainable conservation means, means uh, uh, bringing the public in, into it. So that's why we created um, an app called Sea Watch, where you can report hazards, um, illegal activity, and that's sent automatically to uh, the relevant authorities. If it's a legal activity, it's Nature and Parks Authority, um, and they can and they can 
uh, respond um, in real time to whatever that, that report is. Um, so this is what um, it looks like. This was actually taken in the Red Sea. So the only picture not coming from the Mediterranean today. I see we don't have sound here, but it's okay because we were just um, it's, uh, emotional music that we're missing. Um, so this is another type of ray that was caught in a net about five years ago, it was filmed and was then released um after being reported um in our app so that's what the app looks like and that allows everybody to take um to take part real time um in in ocean conservation so they can report about wounded animals um, illegal fishing any kinds of pollution and also um, ghost nets so 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 fishing gear that has been left behind that's not being used anymore this year we put a very big emphasis on on getting these nets out of the water um, while a fisherman isn't using them anymore to catch fish that doesn't mean that they're not catching fish and other animals um, and they are very dangerous to, to the environment and that's why um, we were working to with a team of uh, of uh, volunteers uh, with a team of volunteers to get all of these uh, um, well not all of them but to get as many of these nets um, out of the system as we can so here's a short film showing one of those. Um, and here on the right, another an, another very large uh, ghost net that was actually in twenty uh, in one of in the most northern reserve here in Israel called the Chaziv. Um, it was deep, about twenty meters uh, deep. So we had to bring volunteers that are are, are also great divers. Um, and that was also on the national news. And in this picture, we actually see Ateret, our uh, marine ecologist, um, being interviewed after after getting the net out of the water. So I think this kind of shows. Um, our work um, also in terms of regulation and policy and a lot of, of behind the scenes work to sort of um, change, change things from the root um, and, also, and also working in field to, to make a change um, in, in the day-to-day -day, uh, realities of, uh, of the Mediterranean. So uh, that's us. Um, if you guys are ever in Israel, you're welcome to download our app and take part. We're working um, as we speak on creating a new version of the app um, that will be easier to use um, and maybe in more than one language. Uh, you're welcome um, to our site, um, the fish.org.il. We have a whole part um, there in English. And of course, there's also the, the SPNI. Uh, web page that's also all all redone and beautiful um, and that's a great way to keep uh, following what what we're doing in uh, marine and uh, terrestrial thanks so much thank you very much adas i really appreciate it we have lots of questions here uh, we will get to them uh, right away um avi uh will be putting in a donation link in um in the chat feature here we go to uh, to support to support our work and to support Adas's work and uh, her unit in protecting uh, Israel's marine um, uh, flora and fauna and those incredible habitats that we learned so much about just now. So thanks very much, uh, Adas, and we're going to learn some more. Um, I'll just go through the questions here as they were uh, as they were asked, and some of them you touched on somewhat, and you know, um, be somewhat brief, and we'll. Keep going. A lot of people ask questions in the chat feature as well, so I'll try to get to some of them. Um, uh, what has Israel done to protect the coastline against the proposed pipeline to Cyprus? You talked about the whole gas exploration in general, but uh, anything specific about that? I, I don't have anything anything specific um, about Cyprus. Um, in in general, when talking about uh, infrastructure and gas, the two things that we have to pay attention to 
is um, the, the the exploration for the gas. So for so in this in this case, which is less re relevant, which is good because that can be pretty detrimental. We're talking about the um, the infrastructure itself that can hurt animals in the vicinity of the actual infrastructure. And the most important part is making sure that we have good enough regulation um, and a good enough hold in terms of what's going on um, to make to, to try to minimize as much as possible spills, oil spills and and um, unexpected uh, um, uh, Yeah, mishaps, mishaps. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, you know, and I'll just mention, you mentioned also the um, the sort of uh, Wild West situation in our EE zone, the uh, economic enterprise zone, the Israel economic waters. And by the way, so if correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about nine or 10 kilometers off sea is the territorial waters and up to 40 kilometers is the uh, right. economic waters. And that part, as you mentioned, is not regulated. It's not Israeli law in general, Israeli environmental law specifically doesn't, uh, isn't in effect there. And uh, that is why we fought SP and I and took a lot of uh, public flack for fighting the, um, the the gas platform that they wanted to build uh, there uh, off of the coast of south of Haifa. And, uh, and we also fought against it being on land because that seemed very dangerous to liquefy and bring things on land. So that's why it's nine kilometers off the coast and we're still getting flack for that as an organization, but we found the we found the sweet spot to put it in water that could that could regulate it, and we could keep an eye on it, and mm -hmm. uh, not on land and not out deep. So um, that's an example of that. Uh, okay, so the pipeline we've discussed um, sea level rise, or is Israel looking at that? Yeah, see, um, I, I actually didn't put it into my presentation because it happened um, today. But we have cliffs along the um, part of our coastline. Um, cliffs that are that are falling that are being eroded, um, and this is partly due to uh, sea level climb. Um, we mm -hmm. have um, special. Um, how do you say it in English? Tavlaot gidud. Gidud. Yeah, tavlaot sort of these special uh, slabs of stone that are in the water that have always uh, been sort of fused uh, right at sea level. Um, and, and their job was also to protect from uh, waves that are coming towards the cliffs and, and, and eroding them. And since the sea level has been rising, one of the problems is that those uh, slabs of stone are starting to sink or not sink, but the water is is covering them, um, and and we're seeing the effects of that, especially in the cliffs that are that are falling. So, on one of our beaches in in central um, Israel, this morning we woke up to these pictures of um, no, not concrete. It's something natural, and that I can't remember the name of. It's a it's a very it's a it's a it's a special habitat. Um, uh, um, and you're talking about the Korkar cliffs, right? The sandstone cliffs. Yeah, sandstone we, cliffs. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's scary stuff. But even scarier to think the water is going to get up past Yarkon, past Kovshim, and uh, up to Ibn Virol. I saw in a study, I think, that bordered it a couple of years ago. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, we're not we don't have an answer for that yet. I don't think. Nope, no answers. Um, Okay, the impacts of, and you talked a brief a bit, bit about it, but you know, everybody asks us when I'm abroad and I talk about it, the impacts of uh, the desalinization plants on the coast, the effluence of the uh, desalinization plants in particular. Uh, California seems to be very concerned by it, and we seem to be not that concerned. Not very concerned. Yeah. Not um, I'm I'm not sure if that's just because there isn't enough research um, going on. The from the some research that I know about, um, but that's already years back, was showing that it does affect the very close environment to where the effluent is coming. But um, once it sort of uh, um, meshes with the rest of the water, we really don't see. Um, very large effects. Um, some, something that could be different, but this is an idea um, um, not based on, on research that I've read, is that the Eastern Mediterranean is very, very salty to begin with. Um, and that might mean that the, that the change isn't as uh, extreme compared to salinity in California, but I'm not sure what salinity is there. 
but we're monitoring it and so far so good yep thanks 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 god because that's that desalination water is important and if you've been paying attention to our previous webinar about freshwater resources in israel you know that we are will soon be uh reversing the flow of the national water carrier bringing desalinated water to the north and we are fighting ask me and i to make sure that that goes its fair share to nature uh, or at least to uh, replace water that's used by agriculture and in, in, uh, in municipal use. And uh, then we can leave more natural water for nature. So it is all connected. And uh, it's, you know, uh, it's important for us to monitor that, the effluent, because otherwise, because it, it's crucial to our lives here. Um, is the, has the almost extinct monk seal ever appeared on the Israeli coast? Yes, for sure. Um, not often, but every, every few years, um, there is a sighting of the monk seal. Um, in what is the largest uh, marine reserve in Israel right now in Rosh Hashanah Ziv, so right on the border with Lebanon, um, where there's also caves and taverns, which are exactly what they like. So every few, every few years we, we see a monk seal there, yeah. Did you say taverns or caverns? Uh, caverns. I said taverns, but I meant oh, caverns. Okay, I, yeah, but the, maybe they like taverns too. If there's a, if there's a good <laughs> tavern in Rosh Nikra, let us know. Because, uh, we're always looking for a good place. Um, listen, could it be possible that on the north end of the Ashkelon Beach, there's a sign that says there's a nature reserve, but new roads and apartments are, have been have been built in the area and they're affecting the turtles? Um, there are not roads and buildings being built inside of reserves. Um, that's for sure. So maybe it's right outside of, of, of the borders of the reserve. Um, maybe it's a reserve that hasn't been declared yet. Again, there's lots of different um, of uh, stages that you have to go through before it's an actual declared reserve, but I'm not sure exactly what you're, and, and does it ever, you're referring to. And does it ever, can it be rescinded once it's a reserve? Can, can the government decide to do something there? Technically, no, but I mean, the idea is no, right. but who right. knows what it'll be. Who knows, who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, in America, by the way, and I'm probably in Canada and most of the Western countries, but not so much in Israel, cities, towns, municipalities oh. declare their own nature reserves. Right? Mm. But that doesn't really happen here, does it? No. No. So, because I'm wondering if maybe the sign was just not exactly a nature reserve, but somebody's idea of a nature reserve. There are areas here that the community, I mean, communities have a lot of power. And so there are areas where you've seen in Israel where um, reserves or at least uh, um, um, national parks um, are created or get rolling from the fact that a community wanted to protect a certain area. So we can start out that way. Um, I'll take a, um, a, a, an educated guess at answering Miroslav's next question about why was bottom trawling not just outlawed, um, you know, outright. And I'm guessing that because politics and legislation is the art of the possible and we got what we could because yeah. the fishing industry, uh, though only I understand about a thousand families in Israel who are supported by fishing industry mm -hmm. have a strong lobby. Yeah. And, um, and uh, in general, agriculture and and uh, that and animal husbandry have uh, both strong lobbies and a lot of sentiment in Israel. So that that is probably why, but we're working on it and it will be outlawed. We won't yeah. stop until it's outlawed. And we sink all those trawlers. Um, uh, regional fishery management councils in America regulate fisheries. Do we have or should we adopt such an oversight program? Who, who, who regulates the fisheries? Um, here it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, so they have a fisheries unit, um, and they definitely need to step up their, their work. So, so there's a lot going on that should be, that should be done a lot better. For instance, research in, in terms of, um, even just monitoring what's going on. We don't have a baseline with looking back 20 years. We don't have a baseline saying what was here 50 years ago. Uh, we can't say even today, the, the new laws that have been passed. Um, it's hard to monitor the difference between what was here five years ago and today, and that's because Ministry of Agriculture should be should definitely be doing more. Um, also, in terms of of helping pass uh, laws that protect, again, all of these laws are protecting nature, but are protecting fishermen and fish uh, 
it together. Meaning if, if we want to be able to fish something in 10, 20, 30 years from now, we need to be protecting fish now. So Right. And, and I, somebody asked in the question, in the chat feature, I believe, something about how does overfishing refer to fishing that is fish that are thrown away and not used. But no, overfishing, overfishing refers to the fishing too much so that the fish can't reproduce, basically. Exactly. And, and, the, and, the, and the stocks deplete. And that's yeah. what's happened. And uh, it's been declining. It's to... Yeah, it's exploiting the fish faster than what we're allowing them to, to mm -hmm. replenish themselves. And part of the reason that that's happening is because we're also fishing in, in very unselective methods, meaning when we're catching 50 to 80 uh, percent of fish that we don't even need, we're going to fish twice as hard to get to that 100 percent of what we do need. Um, so. Um, great. Listen, this is a you could give a probably a whole webinar on this question, but uh, try to do it briefly. There's a lot more questions. Of course, they're coming in now at the end as well. Um, please comment on how the new environment minister, uh, now that the ruling coalition is in the majority, has impacted SBNI's goals. Um, very much, I have to say, I feel the government and not only Ministry of, uh, of Environment, but also many other uh, members of parliament who are definitely environmentally oriented um, um, and, and we have partners to, to be working with, which is a very big change as to what we have. We, oh. we, we do. You mentioned other ministers. The Minister of Energy uh, has been helpful. Minister of Interior less so. And I think we go down the ministries because the government coalition is not, you know, it's a coalition and it's, it's very broad. And it's, uh, but, but the environment minister herself, I hear on the radio every morning and I rub my eyes. I can't believe that this is the environment minister talking and not, well, we know it's our former legal advisor who is her senior uh, because her senior advisor now is, uh, is, is um, I hear her voice behind that, but, yeah. but it's amazing. And I'll just give a quick promo on May 1st, the first webinar we're doing after Pesach, I will be interviewing Gitit Weissblum, who's our lobbyist in the Knesset uh, and our government uh, affairs specialist. She'll be talking to us about uh, her work and the fact that, as Hadas mentioned, we have, there's several members of Knesset who are as uh, hardworking and uh, passionate environmentalists as we've ever had in the Knesset. Uh, certainly since Doug Hanin resigned. Um, and uh, and uh, that that really does impact, impact our work a lot and for the better. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, how many kilometers are Israel's uh, territorial waters? Square kilometers, do you know offhand? I guess it's probably about three quarters of, or of or four fifths of- I feel like mountain. four might, might be about, oh, I have it somewhere. I'm really not good at remembering numbers. Yeah, we'll get to that later. <laughs> Um, let's just continue. What does FAO stand for? And do they set for standards or just report data? It's um, food and I just looked it up because I had a feeling you guys would ask, um, but it's not open on my Google anymore. Food and agriculture? It's, uh, food and agriculture. It's basic. It, it belongs to the UN. Yeah. Food so it's the UN. organization probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. Right. So, so it's, it's the it's the UN that's uh and, that's sort of monitoring. Do they, set, do they set standards or do they just report data? Um, so they no, they set standards, but also through smaller organizations. We work um with the GFCM, which is the Fisheries Commission um, of the Mediterranean. So so that's one way where we where standards are coming through in terms of um, what's allowed and what's not. Um, Israel adheres to some of it and less the, to other parts. So, but that is a, a way in terms of what's happening in the EEZ for sure. One of one of the ways that we're working on that is by is by working together with the GFCM, with the Fisheries Commission. Um, who's the watchdog for the gas rigs? Is it the Ministry of Environment? Um, yes. If if we can call them watchdogs, it would be them. Uh, the problem is today is that the ministry. Uh, sorry, did you say Minister of Environment or of Energy? I said I'm it's energy. Energy, yes. Energy. The, the, today, Ministry of Environment um, can give their opinion on things that are happening in the EEZ, but there's no, you don't have to listen to what they're what they're saying. So they're they're it's, they don't really have any power in terms of deciding if there's going to be gas exploration or not. And the Energy Ministry of um, uh, oversees them from a commercial standpoint more than anything else though correct yes mm -hmm. 
So that seems pretty bad. Yes. Um, oh, Dan Pav asks a hopeful question, our um, board member in uh, Santa Fe. Is there any hope that neighboring countries, particularly Egypt, can coordinate with Israel to protect the Mediterranean? Well, we know there's a coalition of Mediterranean countries that were deeply involved in in many ways and have been for years, but say yeah. a word about that and about the Arab countries particularly. Um, I think things are sort of happening maybe a bit behind the scenes and not officially and more between people and less between governments. Um, um, I don't know to say, I mean, and again, you have the GFCM, this, this commission that sort of can help um, um, connect the countries, but today there isn't um, any official uh, joint work on that. Okay. There is there is a little bit more um, um, in research, meaning I do know that in research um, there there is a little bit more of uh, of communication in terms of sharing data and so on. Okay. Um, um, could you show the Sea Watch app logo? Somebody's Lucy says she can't find it on Play Store. She right? might not be. You might not be able to find it, Lucy, because um, um, you're. The app store, if you're not in Israel, like if you're not registered in Israel, um, will not show up. It's that big H right there. Yeah. That's what it looks like, an H with like water under it. Anyway, binoculars, I guess that is. I'm not sure what that is. That, that yeah, binoculars and H. Binoculars, okay. Um, so uh, uh, moving right along, oh, questions coming along. How did the ghost nets get there? Um, most of the time they're lost at sea, um, uh, ghost gear in general, uh, and, and, and discarded gear in, in oceans is a problem, not only in Israel. So, so we're talking fishing lines and nets that are, that are just lost at sea. Um, sometimes they're deliberately left there. Um, if they're ripped and if you can't use them anymore, it's easier to leave them there than to, to take them back to shore. Um, yeah, and most of them are made of plastic, so they don't disintegrate for very, very long. Yeah. If ever. Yeah, scary stuff. Um, the, Peter Dratch asks, are there, any, are, are there any fishing recovery reserves in the Mediterranean? I'm not, I don't even know what that is. I'm also not sure what that is. Okay. Peter, if you want to let us know, or obviously we're going to something and Google that. Um, Who's responsible for extinguishing fires on, on gas platforms or ships if they're outside of Israel's territorial waters? That would be one of the very, very important questions um, to answer um, or, or to emphasize that we don't have an answer for. Um, because there is no law, there is also no, I mean, I'm sure the companies themselves have some sort of protocol of what to do when there's a fire, but we obviously need, um, um, government legislation as well that will that will overlook things like that. Exactly. Absolutely. Oversee, yeah. Um, Rosalind reports about Ashkelon, it's the Avta Yam nature reserve um, that is being decimated on the beach there in Ashkelon. So uh, if uh, we will we will take a look at that and see what's going on. Avtach uh, is, is the reserve that was actually just um, um, uh, approved the, a few weeks ago in terms of, of, uh, of declaring oh. A marine reserve there. So once again, it depends exactly where you're talking. And also when we're talking about what was approved, we're talking about in the sea, not on the beach. But the 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 beach is actually a pretty small area that's actually part of the declared reserve. So you'd have to be looking at the exact borders to see. Again, not that it's okay that they are building stuff there, but if it's right, not inside right. of the reserve. Right. That would make sense. Well, Hadas, gone for Kyle. Thank you very much. We are over the hour and uh you received many, many thanks in the chat. Thank you. Uh, you, you should you should look through as before we before we sign off. <laughs> I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us tonight. You can see us again two weeks from now, same time. Uh, God, I wish I knew when Israel is changing its clocks, and we'll know when we're back to seven hours. Uh, do you happen to know that? Uh, but uh, we'll be doing it at eight o'clock our time, regardless. Uh, two weeks from now, Amir Balaban. Uh, who directs urban nature and uh, he's an ecologist with a lot of insights into what's going on in terms of the recovery of the forests around Jerusalem after the fires last summer. Uh, fires that were quite devastating uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, man and nature. And um, we're gonna look at how nature's recovering and talk a little bit about urban nature as well in two weeks. 
And Tadas, we'll have you back Thank on you. hopefully later in the year or something. Give us another update on what's going on. Sure. Uh, focus it on the sharks or something that people like to hear about. And uh, <laughs> And uh, we will uh, see everybody. Thank you very much, Avi. Great. Thank you everybody Thank for you. joining. And, day, daylight uh, saving, day, daylight saving starts in Israel in March 25th, with it, which is two Fridays from now. So the next one, which is March 27, will be the new time. Back to the old time. Back yeah. to the old. Uh, or back to the new. <laughs> right. Back to the future. Everybody stay on top of your time zones. And, yeah. uh, and your and your territorial zones and your uh, no take zones. So thanks everybody very much. Thank you. Good luck to all of us in the world. And uh, Shavuot Tov. Thank you, Adas. Chag Purim Sameach. Happy Purim, everybody. Bye bye.